Okay, here we go. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Friends of Latin America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. Today's episode is Honduras elects a new future. On November 30th, just two days after historic presidential elections, Honduras's conservative ruling party candidate, Nasri Asufra, conceded defeat in the presidential election, paving the way for his Libre Party rival, Xiomara Castro, to become the first female leader of the Central American country. With over 52% of the votes tallied by the evening of November 30, Castro had 53.4% support and Asfura 34.1%. Although the Electoral Council has not published preliminary vote totals for congressional races, early results point to a possible majority for Castro's Libre Party and its main allies. Asfura's concession brings to an end a turbulent period under the US supported National Party, which has been dogged by scandals and corrupt corruption accusations, especially during the two terms of outgoing President Juan Orlando Hernandez. Hernandez is deeply unpopular and has been implicated in a drug trafficking case in a US federal court. His brother's already in prison, as many of our viewers probably know. He denies wrongdoing, but could face an indictment when he leaves office. Castro's victory will see the center left return to power after a 12 year hiatus that followed the ousting of her husband, former President Manuel Zelaya, in a U.S.-backed coup in 2009. Joining me today to discuss the historic presidential elections in Honduras on November 28 is journalist and my friend Alina Duarte. Alina has a Sunday afternoon news hour on Sin Censura and is a reporter for Canal 14 here in Mexico City. She is also a journalist with Nuestra Red. Alina and I were election observers with CESPAD, Centro de Estudio para la Democracia, in Honduras on November 28. She with the Nuestra Red contingent and myself with the Global Exchange team. Welcome, Alina. Well, thanks for having me, Terry. <laughs> so we saw something quite historic while in Honduras on the 28th of November. And um, it was really, um, it was quite a mar I guess on many levels, a marvelous experience, a, a marvelous foreign policy experience, a marvelous human rights and economic rights, and a, and a wonderful story for women in leadership. So a lot of levels of, of success and, and things to celebrate. So why don't we, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you responded on the 28th and then maybe we can share with our, with our audience what the whole electoral process was like, the technicalities of it, and then what we, we think is possible for Honduras and, and perhaps the rest of the Americas in the coming year. Yeah, well, for me, it was amazing uh, being in Honduras. That was my first time in that country. And for me, it was very important uh, being there, uh, especially when we talk here in Mexico all the time about Honduras, but only when it comes about uh, migrants, when we talk about poverty. So for me, it was very, very important. Uh, also, because I thought that this was a fight against imperialism, definitely. Um, uh, and it's impressive that more than a week before, after the elections, we still don't have the final results mm -hmm. uh, with around the 90% of the proceedings counted. Shumara Castro has more than 50%. Uh, I think now it's something that, I mean, everyone now is like sure that she is the, the elected president at this point, but it's impressive uh, that I mean, more than, than a week after, uh, we still do not have the 100% of the vote it's counted. Um, November 28th, it was a, um, a date of uh, big tensions uh, due to the antecedents of the 2009 coup and the fraud of 2017 that left more than 30 persons who were assassinated. I think those, uh, those uh, issues were the most important for the people who were really afraid, were scared, 
uh, of uh, just waiting uh, that what could happen that day after the polls were closed. Um, I was in the south of Honduras in a department called Choluteca. And I think, I, I guess that was the, uh, like the feeling of all of the population in the whole country. Uh, they were expecting for the results. I was impressed by how many people went uh, to the polls. It was more than 67% of the population. That's a high number of, of people. We are talking uh, about a country of 9 million and a half people where 74 of them are under poverty and people voted, uh, I mean, more than 67%, it's a lot. They were uh, very tired of a government, as you say, Terry, uh, a government that his brother is now in prison in New York because of uh, narco traffic, uh, uh, a government that killed several activists and human rights defender under this government. Uh, a lot of people have been assassinated. The most involved case is that of Berta Cáceres, who was assassinated for defending the territory. And now it's uh, like a national or even a, a, a global struggle, uh, the justice for Berta Cáceres. Um, and now uh, people went to the polls, so that was my impression, just tired of this government, of this situation of poverty, uh, tired of corruption, tired of, uh, they say that uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, he, the, actual, uh, the actual president, it's a narco dictatorship. So that's why I think so many people decided going to the polls and in this case, voting for the, the leftist option. I don't, I, I wouldn't say that this is a socialist or a radical option. Uh, and it's very difficult to believe that after an alliance with a center right, Shomara Castro will have the capacity to move towards a more progressive agenda. That's one of the, the, the risks that we're gonna see during the next eight years. But most of the people believe that this was the best option and that's why Shomara uh, is gonna be the, the next president of Honduras. Well, you know, it's curious that, it's not curious, you know, I think we all know why <laughs> the Western media has decided to define her, her presidency as leftist, when in fact, it really is a coalition of center, left of center and center right um, personalities and parties. And I would argue that that was necessary, the necessarily necessary political strategy to defeat a really heinous government that, Hon that the Honduran people has suffered since the 2009 coup. But, and um, it will, it, it's going to be, uh, it is, it's not gonna be without its challenges to govern, to hold the coalition together and govern, but so necessary for the Honduran people. The turnout on the 28th was enormous. And I think, you know, you and I both commented when we were there that it was really a statement of fuera ho, as which has been the same for, for several years now, but also a statement and preservation of national sovereignty. People wanting their country back and wanting to govern it in, with their own definition of politics and economics. And um, it was a really powerful moment. I was just so our audience knows, I was in uh, Departamento Yoro, which was towards the east, um, not far from the Atlantic coast. I was based in, in the city of El Progreso. Some of, some of our audience will know El Progreso as the home of El Radio Progreso. And um, it's quite large. It was, um, I found it very understated being there. And I think, you know, Alina, you and I commented on this at one point that perhaps there was a reticence among the people given the history, particularly the coup in 2009, but the overturn of elections and well, the stealing of them in 2017, people not being quite sure what was really going to happen. And um, so the huge turnout on Sunday, the 28th was quite something to marvel at. And yet um, 
there was some reticence the evening of Sunday the 28th as well. And of course, now the whole country is, you know, <laughs> openly celebrating and it's really a wonderful thing to see. I wonder, um, we, we should share with our audience what the electoral process is physically like in Honduras. It, it did see improvements, and I will say this is just from my personal experience, there definitely were improvements over prior um, electoral observation delegations. Um, I would say to me personally, it's somewhat of a chaotic uh, voting process where people's hands touch the ballot in a way that I personally would be uncomfortable with. <laughs> and that's, there's a lot of hands touching a person's ballot from many different people before it actually gets into the ballot box. Other than that, it seemed to be a process that people had enough confidence in to actually show up and vote in, in mass on the 28th. And that is probably the largest measuring stick of all electoral um, processes is do people have confidence in it to, sh to actually show up and participate. And that to me was definitely present. Yeah, it was it was very hard to understand the whole process because it, took, <laughs> it was very, very long. Uh, it was, for example, you and I, we were in Venezuela and it took lo like a minute or a minute and a half or two minutes yeah. just to vote. And in Honduras, it was more than three, even five minutes. Uh, first, the people found them in the, the, they found the table where they were gonna vote. Then they located on a paper list. Then they enter and they receive the ID and they uh, they put the, their finger and they receive the, the ballot and then they have to 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 sign the ballots and then they have to vote and then they have to come back and once again the the people on the in the on the table uh, sign again and put some. Um, uh, how do you say sayos? A stamp. Uh, have stamp. So mm -hmm. it was yeah. it was really really long after they just vote. So at the beginning, with several people deciding uh, going to the to the polls, uh, there were uh, really long long lines uh, during the morning in the first hour because it was a long process. Uh, with I mean, as I said. So, or around 70% of the population voted. And with this long, long a process, it was very confusing. And of course, even, even the, the ballot for electing the Congress people, mm -hmm. it was also very difficult. They had uh, like 10 lines of the parties of the, of the candidates of each party, and they had the opportunity for voting for nine of these Congress persons. So in case, they they marked 10 it was invalid um, in case they um, there were there were another like several up i mean there was the possibility of making a fraud in case they only choose six or five mm -hmm. another person could uh, you know choose the rest of them it was pretty pretty complicated and i don't think that the um, that the people in the polls were really conscious about the process. They were very confused. Even the people who who were in the tables, they didn't know the whole process in the morning. They were also very confused. They didn't receive a lot of capacitation. They didn't know uh, how to act. It was pretty confused. I don't know if you, you agree on that, but it was really long, tired, and confusing everything. It was, you know, for me being in El Progreso, I noticed and I and I would say from experience, this is this is customary throughout Latin America. First and foremost, elections are held on Sunday in the majority of the countries, unlike the United States. And I cannot stress the importance of that enough, how that does attract, inspire and promote voter turnout and participation. In the United States, we vote on Tuesdays, which is not a federal holiday, and people have to figure out how to take time off work, students in school, parents with childcare responsibilities. It's really, um, you know, you have to do some personal gymnastics in order to vote in the United States, whereas um, the majority of Latin America, if not all of Latin America, it's on Sunday. So that is a really, wonderful thing to see 
And what also I have found to be more customary is that there are lines in the morning. People line up before the polls open. In Honduras, it was 7 a.m. Um, my polling center, not all tables were open at 7 a.m. There were some, I mean, and not for the lack of trying. There was truly due diligence in trying to get all the tables opened at 7. Some of the tables had problems initiating the finger identification um, electronics. And once they got that enabled, everything, you know, started operating more or less smoothly. But what I saw first thing in the morning and which I saw earlier in the month in Nicaragua on November 7th and again in Venezuela on 21 November is that older people vote first thing in the morning in general. I mean, that's a gen, you know, that's a generalization, but, and you mentioned that there were, you know, three ballots, one for president, one for con congressional, um, elections and then one for the local elections and three ballots and then when you were done had to be you know verified by the table signed stamped and signed off on and then each ballot had to be put in its respective urn its respective ballot box and I will say for some of the older people that I observed it was confusing to make sure that the right ballot three ballots to begin with and then that each you know ballot was properly verified and then after that each ballot went in the correct box although there was plenty of where i was plenty of instructional assistance to make sure that people so the the older people did have, I say older, people like my age and older, um, did have um, instructional assistance um, from, the from the people uh, monitoring the tables. And, I, and that, I have to say, I, you know, it was a wonderful thing to see. It was not interfering with their vote. That had all been you know, done privately. But you know, just respecting their vote and respecting their need for assistance and offering it, I, that was a really um, wonderful thing to see. Then we saw in, we saw a kind of a lull in the day, like midday, like between 11 and one where people would maybe be at church or having their family meal. And then things picked up again later in the afternoon before poll closing, particularly among younger people. I saw a lot of the youth vote come out like four o'clock in the afternoon. And that was really encouraging as well. I didn't see any at the, at the Mesa that our JRV is what they're called in Honduras. It was very, I have to say, I was impressed with the team running the table I witnessed. And I stayed at one table for the entire day. I, I was impressed with their um, knowledge of the voting process and how they, equitably and equally en enforced it among all voters. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was inspiring actually to see, particularly, and I don't say this to be disparaging, but particularly given the history of elections in Honduras, it was very, very encouraging to witness what I personally saw on the 28th. It was very encouraging. Yeah. And, it, and it's an example of what's possible going forward, what can be perpetuated going forward. Yeah, and actually, I was I was very surprised about, as you said, young people. I talked to them, these uh, these persons who they were. It was the first time they they were voting, mm -hmm. and I was asking them, "Is this your first time? Why are you so happy?" Because they were so happy when they went to the polls, and they were saying, "Because we grew up under this dictatorship, mm -hmm. we only see, we only saw during twelve years devastation, poverty, corruption." So they were saying that this was gonna be the generation who was gonna change Honduras. They were so happy. I uploaded a video of one of them and she was so, so happy. Um, and, as, and, as, and as her, I don't remember her name, uh, a lot of people, a lot of young, young people who, uh, as I said, is the, it was the first time they were really enthusiastic. They were with their families. Their families were so happy too. Um, I think the, the day, even, even a day before the elections, we were wondering how was going to be. Everyone was talking about the possible violence, about the tensions, uh, but 
it didn't happen uh, until the close of the polls. I could feel that that might be uh, violent because people were really excited about knowing the results. Uh, they were there. There was a lot of tension at that point around five six p.m. in the in the afternoon. People were just wondering uh, who was going to win. And at the poll, I was, it, was, it was hard for me because, um, you know, the people has to show, the person in charge has to show the boats. Uh, when it was a uh, Shomara boat, uh, she didn't want to say anything and she had to yell the name. She has to say Shomara and uh, Nasrias Fura. So she was from the party of the of the actual government. She, so she didn't want to say it loud. And there was a lot of people outside the center, about the, the pool center. Um, they were going crazy because they wanted to, to take notes and, and to count the boat by boat. It was amazing. And at some point, people were saying, like, thank God you are there telling me uh, we needed more observers. We need people like you recording. We need more uh, international people uh, just watching this historical day. So it was a big responsibility, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think. I was so stressful. You know, it was it was stress uh, because I I, I know that it was the big day for Honduras after 12 years of this government, after the coup, after the 2017 elections with a lot of violence. Uh, violence. So I know that it was a big responsibility, but the whole day people were recognizing the role of the observers. And that's something that I'm, I'm really grateful of being there, uh, of, of see the, the, whole, uh, the whole elections. It was a big responsibility and people uh, were taking it like that. Like yeah. they, they knew that it was a big day for not only for the present of Honduras, but for the next generation. So it was amazing. It was, um, I will say we should give a shout out to CESPOD um, because you and I were part of, of um, teams that were um, organized under CESPOD. This was their first, basically a prototype um, national election observation um, delegation for them. And I've shared this with, with other people as well. I personally believe it was amazingly well run. There are a lot of organizations who have been doing that type of work for a number of years and who still don't get it quite right. And I think what you and I experienced on the 20th and even, and leading up the entire delegation from our arrival to Honduras till our departure, um, the educational opportunities we had, the meetings that we, we were, uh, that were arranged for us, the education, uh, and also really what was very impressive to me, and you'll probably laugh, but <laughs> all the forums we got, you know, particularly for election day, really detailing everything that was our responsibility, everything that we were to be looking for and watching at and what the protocol and process was very, very thorough. And it really was an enormous responsibility and an honor, a real honor to have been mm -hmm. invited and participate in it. And it was a huge responsibility for, for the young people of Honduras. Imagine this being your first election, the first election you're qualified to participate in, to vote in, and to having this enormous responsibility of changing the direction of your country. I mean, that's a really profound thing to take into the polling center with you at, at a very young age. And yet the young people had such a, um, they were all very mature and very professional, especially the ones that were our guides, that they had really, um, well-defined leadership skills and a real sense of responsibility and desire to uh, create a new future for themselves. And that, that was really, um, at times made me teary-eyed to be around them. It was very, very inspiring, but also kind of yeah. sad to see that they have to, have to assume that so young, <laughs> yeah. you know, right? I mean, just what they were born and raised under um, and yet they've embraced it and are, you know, we'll take, I really believe they're gonna take their country forward. I think that um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was um, 
well, and me as well, that we had three ballots, one of them presidential, congressional, and local being mayoral or what they call deputies, I believe. Um, the congressional uh, count is taking a very, very long time. I, you know, you mentioned this when you first started describing the process. And that's concerning, and I think viably concerning because that is the complexion of the Congress is going to determine exactly how much the incoming president is going to be allowed to do or not do. And the Congre Congress is 128 seats, I believe. It looks like with the Libre Party and its coalition, they may achieve 64 seats. But again, that goes to the coalition that you were defining earlier on, that it's a real you know, it's not one political ideology. It's not one consolidated vision. It's a mixed bag, but 64 seats could could help the president president really implement a good percentage of her of her vision. We hope, but it is concerning that the congressional results are taking so long. I mean, these elections took place Sunday the 28th and we still don't know exactly what the Congress looks like in Honduras. And yeah. that's where the, that's where, you know, a legislative, so to speak, coup could happen. The negating of her powers or the control of, of her power as president. Yeah, as I said, Shomara won with this alliance. Um, because of this alliance, we still don't know how this progressive agenda will look like, even when she has put in the center so many uh, promises that she has done to the population. But at the same time, uh, I totally agree that one of the main issues is uh, the Congress, and we still don't know how it looks like at this point after a week and a half of the elections. We still don't know uh, actually uh, the, the presidential results and and also the congressional results. Um, and also, I don't know uh, how the how the other parties will allow, because as we said, it's not a leftist alliance. And we know that it was necessary because it reminds me a lot of Mexico 2018 that mm -hmm. AMLO wanted to do this big alliance. So we don't have any doubt about the, his uh, his presidency about right. it, that he won with a lot of the population uh, supporting him. I think it was pretty similar what what happened in Honduras, but uh, I mean, uh, here in Mexico, the alliance, um, especially there was a party that it was from the right, I, I would say, but the rest of the alliance, it was like a progressive one. And in the case of Honduras, it is not the case. Salvador Nasralla with the party, uh, Salvador, uh, Salvador de Honduras, uh, he, he ran for presidency in 2017, uh, also with an alliance with Xiomara Castro and Partido Libre. Uh, we have to say once again that Xiomara Castro represents uh, the leftist part of the politics in, in, in Honduras. He is the wife of uh, the former president, Manuel Zelaya, and Manuel Zelaya, has insisted that the coup against him was because he wanted to uh, make, like put more to the left, the politics in, in Honduras. And that's why they orchestrated a coup against him. But now we don't know how, how we look at government of this kind of alliance. You have uh, the spokesman of the oligarchs or some, uh, businessmen in Honduras at the same time that you are promising that you're going to fight them in the case of Xiomara. So it's going to be very complicated, especially with when so many people decided to vote for Xiomara in the presidency, but at the same time, they still voted for the liberal party that is the center left. Uh, or the center, I, I, I wouldn't say center More. left at all, the Liberal Party. Center. Center. Also, <laughs> yeah, it's a center center. So they voted for Xiomara and at the same time they voted in the in the Congress for, for another party, might right. be in the center left, in the center right. So it's very complicated to believe. I, I, I cannot believe that there's gonna be a, a government 
like Evo Morales in Bolivia or like even Rafael Correa who wasn't a socialist. I don't know what's gonna happen at this point. The only thing we are sure at this moment is that Juan Orlando Hernandez and National Party, Partido Nacional lost the election and we still don't know what's gonna happen with the president also. People are wondering if he is going to live on Honduras or if he is going to stay. Um, we, we don't know uh, so many things. He'll get a nice it. house in Doral, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I <should> just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't know. It's yeah. We don't know. Meanwhile, yeah. meanwhile, his his brother is in jail. So yeah. there is a, there is a lot of things that we're gonna we're gonna see next month or in a year because we don't know how our government of Xiomara in alliance with the center right is gonna look like. She, to me, you know, in listening to your comments, she to me is is inheriting a situation with you know a population that wants to move center left, wants a, a government more concerned about social investment, infrastructure, in, social investment and in infrastructures and institutions, but with a very powerful wealthy oligarchy remaining in the country, which is not unlike the Venezuela that Hugo Chavez inherited. And it's still that yeah. complexity exists in Venezuela. So, you know, something else you mentioned was, was this huge majority created in, you know, for AMLO to win in, uh, or the coalition created for AMLO to win in Mexico and Xiomara to win in Honduras. And I think, unfortunately, that at this moment is needed. The center, the, I, I hate to say left because that's such a, um, I mean, even though that's where our politics tend to go, it's, it's such a term defined by, by Western media that it often is much more to the right than what it, than what it sh should be. But for progressive to leftist or even governments center left now seem to have to win with a super majority so that there is no question as to their political capital when they when they take office and and i you know i think the president of mexico was very smart in that strategy i mean it does have some restraints once you're elected but but you can't question you know the president's uh position uh, or nor the win itself when you have that super majority and unfortunately i think that's what's going to take going forward particularly throughout latin america and so let's talk a little bit about, before we close our, our episode, let's talk a little bit about what this win for Xiomara Castro means or could potentially mean for Central America and the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. Yeah, well, um, as I say, it's pretty complicated to know what's gonna happen with these alliances and we still don't know because even inside Honduras it's pretty complicated because a lot of the social movements, uh, human rights defenders, they voted for Shamar because it was the best option, but not because they trust the actual institutions, the actual government, or because they trust even in the party. They were just tired of being assassinated and that's why they voted for Xiomara. So even in Honduras, it's pretty complicated to understand what's gonna happen, what's the next step. Uh, social movements, they uh, maintain the, their distance of Xiomara. They voted for her, but at the same time, I don't know if there's gonna be a kind of coalition with these movements that are more in the left, they're pretty to the left than uh, the, the, the candidate, than Xiomara Castro. So for Central America, we are seeing, for example, in El Salvador, a government of Bukele, who is really aligned to the US interest. Uh, also, that is reconfigurating a lot of things uh, with the Biden's administration. Uh, we've seen uh, a Nicaragua under imperialism, <laughs> all the time, aggressions all the time, imperialist aggressions all the time. Time. In the last elections in November 7, where you were, um, uh, you were there in, in Nicaragua, we we saw the aggressions against the government of Daniel Ortega. And I think it, this was not about if you like or not Daniel Ortega. It was uh, it was an open aggression against the Sandinista uh, the, the Sandinist movement. Um, 
so with Honduras, uh, like moving, moving a little bit more to the left, definitely uh, we we can expect an, an alliance in the region. Uh, Honduras, I was I was saying uh, in uh, to my colleagues, to my friends, uh, the importance of Honduras to the U.S. Uh, was uh, very important because I mean the importance was. Honduras is in Central America, in Central America, the same as Colombia in South America, yeah. and it, that Israel in, 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 the in yeah, in the Middle East. So now without Honduras, I don't know what, what's the next step of the U.S. Uh, in the region, maybe moving, moving the alliance to, to El Salvador, uh, moving uh, forward to attack. Uh, I don't know what's gonna, what, what, what's gonna, what, what, what the U.S. is gonna do in Central America, but also we saw uh, the victory of Xiomara Castro, <laughs> because Biden administration is not in the best <laughs> in the best moment. <laughs> we, I, I was, I was, I was telling my friends like maybe uh, they would have tried a fraud or another another kind of moves in in Honduras. I mean the U.S. and the oligarchies and the right wing, but they couldn't because even the U.S. is not able to make a fraud or to do something else outside. Meanwhile, uh, after Afghanistan, after. Uh, by this administration, uh, like uh, the mess that that means now <laughs> by this administration at this point. So not only for Central America, for the rest of the region, uh, Honduras, and also it was a month, a whole month full of electoral processes yeah. in Latin America. So it was oh, not only about Honduras, it was about Nicaragua, it was, uh, it was about Venezuela. Uh, in Venezuela, even with the European Union and the OAS as observers, they, uh, they couldn't say that it was a fraud or that it was illegit illegitimate the elections. So we are seeing the people empowering themselves Themselves in the region that the U.S. under this uh, context, they are not able to, to implement a, a destabilization or a fraud or something. So it was a, a process in the middle of another electoral processes. And also we're going to see what's going to happen in Chile next uh, in a week and a half. It's very important because it's a far, far right <laughs> against the, the, the left or the center left uh, with Boric. So Honduras was um, was very important for the US, not only for Central America, also for Mexico. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, AMLO uh, does uh, hasn't uh, the power to solve during his administration is the migrant situation, the migration issue. Uh, and of course, he, Mexico government should be interested in collaborating with the new government of Honduras so they can solve or they can give another answers, another, um, yeah, another answer to the, how they're, how the Mexican government are treating, is treating now the immigration uh, issue. So it was important for the whole region, even for Latin America, the Caribbean, Mexico, North America, uh, this election. So even when it is a, a really small country of nine million and a half person, I mean, we are more Mexican Mexicans in Mexico City than Hondurans in Honduras. <laughs> so it was very important for the whole region. It's very, um, it is a sign of possibility, what's possible. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that is a huge, it's very symbolic. It's a huge message, the possibility and the hope um, of, of what's to come. Um, I guess I should, we should maybe end it there. Possibility and hope for the future, especially for the young people, which includes yeah. you. <laughs> it's, 
Yeah. <laughs> Which includes yeah. you. And um, <laughs> so I want to remind our audience, you've been, you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program. We broadcast every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. We're also, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And don't forget to catch Code Pink Radio every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern on WBAI New York City and WPFW um, out of Washington, D.C. Uh, Code Pink Radio can also be found on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So thank you, Alina. So wonderful thank to you, spend Terry. the hour with you. I always enjoy your time and your friendship. And, um, and I look forward <laughs> to our next conversation. And um, we should all just give a huge shout out to the people of Honduras. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, <laughs> thanks once again, Terry, for the invitation and for having me. I uh, hope uh, we can meet again in another, uh, another episode. We definitely will. And for our audience, you can catch Alina on Scene Censura on Sunday afternoons at one o'clock which is two o'clock Eastern, I believe. And that's seen in sort of uh, YouTube and uh, Canal 14 here in Mexico City. And before we go, tell our audience a little bit about Nuestra Red. About what? About Nuestra Red, because that's who you were in Honduras. Yeah, uh, well, it was not only about CESPAD, it was also a coalition with Global Exchange and Nuestra Red. Nuestra Red is an organization who is always trying to uh, make some noise about global issues, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean and the role of the U.S. specifically in the region. So you can follow Nuestra Red in a Twitter, or you can find it in Nuestra Red MX, uh, because it's from Mexico. And as, a, as you said, a shout out to 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 CESPA, to Global Exchange, and Nuestra Red, who uh, made this possible, this coverage in Honduras. So we are in, in Twitter, in Facebook, and weekly we have some, uh, I mean, I collaborate with them, but I, I assume it's like now my organization, I participate with them it's sometimes like every week, but and um, we have some webinars about, as I said, Latin America, the U.S. imperialism and local struggles here in Mexico, in the U.S. also. So you can follow them in Twitter and in Facebook. Great. Thank you so much. It's a terrific project, all with young journalists from yeah. Latin America, principally Mexico. OK, everyone, um, you can catch us next week. See you then. Thank you. Bye.